child, joy comes in the morning, weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning, the darkest hour means dawn is just inside. If you've knelt beside the rubble of an aching broken heart, when the things you gave your life to fell apart, you're not the first to be acquainted with sorrow, grief, or pain. But the Master promised sunshine after rain. Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning, weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning. The darkest hour means dawn is just in sight. To invest your seed of trust in God in mountains you can't move. You have risked your life on things you cannot prove. But to give the things you cannot keep for what you cannot lose is the way to find the joy God has for you. Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning, weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning, the darkest star means dawn is just inside. The darkest hour means dawn is just inside. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn back to Romans chapter 8. I said turn back to Romans chapter 8 because it's where we've been for the last three services. And I like series. I don't know about you, but I like to study the Word of God verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And we're doing key chapters in the Word of God, and this is one of the best. I believe Romans chapter 8 will set you free. Matter of fact, um, I was looking at all my notes of all the messages I preached, and over 8,000 of them uh, in this place. And um, I preached often on Romans chapter 8 around uh, July 4th, because it's a decoration of freedom. It's a def- decoration of of. Uh, Dependence, not independence, but dependence. And Paul declares four spiritual freedoms uh, in our in this chapter. I wanted to just kind of review the whole chapter real quick, and I'll be brief tonight. But um, first of all, there's the freedom from judgment, and that's no condemnation, verse uh, four, 1 through 4. And thank God we're free from, from going to hell, and we're free from the judgment of uh, the sin, the world, the devil, and we're free from the judgment that is upon all of us. Well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and all and folks, the wage of sin is death. But thank God, Jesus took your death, and you ought to be excited about that. Amen. I know we're few in number, but the two or three people that's here, you ought to say Amen, Amen, because it's freedom. It's real, true spiritual freedom. Then there's the freedom from defeat. The freedom from defeat, no obligation. Chapter 5, or verse 5, chapter 8 of Romans. 
uh, 5 through uh, about uh, 17. There is no obligation to the law. We're free from defeat. Uh, then tonight, I want to preach on freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And that's found in verses 18 through 30, and I believe we'll just cover about 18 through 25. I got two uh, outlines tonight, so y'all are in trouble. I'm like the Sunday school teacher this morning, said he had two outlines, and I'm glad he didn't preach both of them, or teach both of them, or we've been there through the whole church service. And I hope, I hope you know I'm not going to preach both of these outlines, but I got two thoughts on my mind, and don't know where to go except to, to uh, deal with one of them this week and one of them next week. But there's freedom. Uh, you ought to thank God you're free. Thank God I'm free. Free from condemnation. Free from defeat because there's no obligation to the flesh or the law. And there's freedom from discouragement. You know, discouragement is the sin of champions. Uh, Jeremiah was discouraged. He said, I will not speak again. But Jeremiah 20 verse 9 says the word of God was burning in his bones. And he could not stay. Thank God for the word of God will keep us going. Amen. And then Elijah was under the juniper tree. And he had already seen God work. And 850 prophets of hell were destroyed. But he was afraid of one Jezebel that was coming after him. And he got discouraged. He got depressed in 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, Jonah, he got discouraged. And because he did not want to do what God wanted him to do. And he was upset because of uh, uh, God... Uh, trying to spare the people that he kind of didn't like. And then David, he got very discouraged, uh, and he encouraged himself in the Lord after much tragedy and after much wage of sin in his life. And so I guess the best way to, to, um, to encourage ourselves in the Lord is through his word and his spirit. You know, if it's not for the Holy Spirit, you're going to lose spirit. Uh, your attitude will be defeated. And uh, folks, listen, we should not be defeated people. We should not be ones that give up. And uh, the Bible says in verse 18 through 25, if you'll stand on the Word of God, uh, we'll preach a few minutes on uh, this subject of encouragement. Um, by the Holy Spirit, you have hope. And by the Holy Spirit, you're free from frustration and, and discouragement. But it all hits us. We're all that way. But thank God for these truths in verse 18 through 25. The Bible says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now this suffering is not the physical suffering that a lot of people are going through. It's spiritual persecution. But look at verse 19. This is so exciting. It says, For the, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto a glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth, three times the word groans mentioned in this text, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope for, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But, we, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You may be seated as I pray. God, thank you for patience. And thank you for hope. And God, we know that the greatest of these is love, but thank God for faith and hope. And Lord, thank you, dear God, that we can see in your scriptures tonight that there is a blessed hope a blessed hope of knowing that one day we'll be with you and that one day we'll lay down the sword and the battle's over and we'll experience victory and peace and joy in your presence. So Lord, help me. Well, I got a lot on my heart and I know I can't share it all and I know, God, that these folks have come tonight on this holiday weekend 
uh, to hear exactly what you want to, to teach them and, and speak to their hearts and encourage their souls. And so, Lord, not only encourage these that are here, but I pray that you'd encourage those that are not here, that could not be here because of sickness and maybe sorrow. And, Lord, I pray that you'd, you would give them encouragement that only you can give. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's three groans in this chapter, and I'll cover probably two of them tonight. But, you know, I think about when Jesus groaned at the tomb of Lazarus. And um, one other time in Mark chapter 15, I believe it is, he groaned. Uh, and folks, Jesus cares. And Jesus loves us. And so I want to give you three things, and I'll just start to, uh, with this and finish next week. But um, first of all, creation groans. I want you to write it down. Creation groans. In verse 18, when God finished his creation, it was a good creation. But now there's suffering. Because of sin, there's pain and death. All which, of course, is the result of Adam and Eve, our great, 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 great grandparents did. And so I want you to notice the words Paul uses to describe the plight of creation. Look at verse 18. It says, For I reckon that suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Suffering. Have you ever suffered? Have you ever suffered so much that you couldn't say a word? You just groaned? I mean, remember the news you got when somebody died? It was, it was beyond words. You could not say a word. You groaned. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit does, and I'll show you that last groan next week. The Holy Spirit groans for us and um, feels for us. And so then also we see in verse 20, uh, it says, For the creature was made subject to vanity. And vanity always means emptiness. Uh, and uh, there's a longing in our soul to have more than we have on this earth. In Psalm 17, the last verse says, when will you be satisfied? And he says, I'll be satisfied when I wake in thy likeness, the psalmist said. So we'll never be totally perfect and we'll never be totally whole until we get to heaven. And until then, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be vanity, there's going to be emptiness. But look at verse 21. It says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage, the bondage uh, of corruption. It's described, creation is in bondage. They want to be, it wants to be free. And then verse 21, it says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. The word corruption reminds us of decay. We're all getting older. And then verse 22, which none of us like, it says, and travaileth in pain together until now. You know, I'm not scared of death, but it's the dying I ain't looking forward to. I'm not too good with pain. How about you? None of us are looking forward to pain and suffering. And the groaning is not a useless thing. Uh, Paul compares it in verse 22. Notice this, travail in pain together unto now. And folks, this word travail is like in childbirth. Um, some of y'all have been through that. It's some bad pain I hear. Uh, I've witnessed it, but I've never experienced it. Some of you men can't take a kidney stone, much less have a baby. Amen? But I heard it's very painful. Um, and pain will end when the child is delivered. There's fruit, and it's worth it all. And one day, creation will be delivered. And that groaning creation will become a glorious creation. We'll be like him. What a prospect. What an encouragement. This is not the end of the story. Life is short at the longest. It's painful and it's sometimes discouraging. But thanks be to God, one day there'll be no more woe. There'll be no more discouragement. There'll be no more depression. That puts a little smile on my face and I don't even feel like smiling tonight. I want to look as mean as I can look. But praise God. I'm telling you, friend, God deliver us from just groaning Futilely, but help us to groan with anticipation. And folks, today's suffering 
is nothing, the Bible says in verse 18, compared to what? The glory that's ahead. Now folks, I believe this suffering, a lot of it that he's dealing with here is the suffering of being a good Christian. The suffering of taking a stand. The suffering of being his called out disciple. And the cost of discipleship is you take up the cross and you deny yourself and you follow him. But in those days, when you did that, it was the death sentence, it was the prison sentence, it was being shunned from your own family. And thank God there was a lot of groaning. And thank the Lord, friend, the only thing that kept these folks going, praise God, was the glory that was set before them. So, so folks, we see not only is uh, creation groaning, but look at verse 23, believers groan. Believers groan. The Bible says in verse 23, for not only they, but ourselves also ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, what? Groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Folks, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And the Bible says that uh, the adoption to wit is the redemption of the body. One day we're going to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. It's going to be far better. It'll be far better. You know, I think as we that get older and <clears throat> get a little more groany and a little more weak and a little more honory, and we shouldn't be, we ought to get sweeter instead of, of a gripey old men or women. And folks, we groan because I believe we have a taste of heaven from the Holy Ghost that gives us a taste. Have you walked in the Spirit, verse 23, says the fruit of we're the first fruits of the Spirit. We have a, 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 an idea. We have a, a taste of heaven. Uh, we've seen a glimpse on the other side. We know that on the other side is peace and joy and purpose and power. On the other side is heaven and, and not hell. On the other side to a Christian that's been walking in the Spirit for a while, uh, taste the blessings of heaven. Uh, we see the Lord. We see that we're going to have a new body. We see heaven. And we're like the psalmist in 17 verse 11. We have a holy discontentment. So we groan. We groan. Folks, I tell you what, we're living in a day and age that ought to get us groaning about sin, about the condition of our country, one nation under God, and they're trying to bury God. But let me tell you this, they're never going to bury God. God might bury us, but he, we're not going to bury God. And folks, I want to tell you something. There's judgment coming, and I believe it's already started through the COVID and through Afghanistan and through all the things that's happening in the streets. I don't believe God's going to put up with this mess much longer. And I believe we can shake our fist at God and have same-sex marriages and, 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 uh, and, um, and uh, human rights that's above his rights. And you say, well, God's just tolerating it. No, God's not tolerating it. God's going to judge it. And we ought to groan because of the sin. We ought to groan because of, of the condition of humanity. Folks, it's low. It's rank. It's ungodly. It's unnatural affection. It's reprobate mind. Look at Romans chapter 1 sometimes. It's de-evolution, not evolution. And the last verse says we're even entertained by sin. That's pretty low, isn't it? Is that we're entertained by murder. We're entertained by the, the things of the world. And folks, we need to realize that we need to wait for the adoption. Look at Philippians chapter 1. And I know you know these verses. And every time you come to a funeral that I preach, I read them. But uh, Philippians chapter 1 is an encouragement to my soul. Look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. We won't be long tonight. I say that every sermon, don't I? I keep on trying to cut it short, but I just want to be thorough. But look at uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, according to my earnest expectation. There's that word, earnest expectation. Folks, there's something wrong in your life if you don't earnestly long for heaven and groan about the condition of this world. It should not be your home. You should not be so deep-seated 
and rooted in the things of the world that you forget that you don't belong to the world and that you're headed to another world. It's going to be far better. It says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, there's the word hope, uh, the discouraged buster is hope. It's not a hope so, it's a hope I know so. You know, it's a hope of our salvation. I don't, it's not uh, translated, I hope I'm saved. It's the hope that you know you're saved. Amen? It says, and my hope and my, in nothing shall I be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And here's the reason. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So we see, first of all, creation is groaning. Uh, it's a fallible creation. It's a decaying. It's a corrupting uh, 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 creation. But we that are recreated, we that are saved, we should groan. Um, the Bible says in verse 24, it says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope for all that a man seeth. Why doth yet he hope for? For if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. See, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Our hope is invisible. Our hope is immortal. Our hope is invincible. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. We're on the winning side. Amen? And we need to be reminded of that through the scriptures and by the Holy Spirit to engrave it in our hearts that we're not to lose hope. We're not to give in or give up or recant. We're not to be discouraged. Folks, the sin of champions is discouraged, but don't stay there too long. Job was discouraged, but thank God through all that he went through, he heard by ear, but then he started seeing by eye the Lord God on the throne. And thank God he came out a lot better than when he, when he went through that valley. And so, folks, the thrilling climax to the adoption um, took place, yes, when we were converted, but also, folks, the full salvation, so to speak, the full inheritance is going to take place when we're with him and when the redemption of our body. Isn't that great? I mean, when we're in heaven, when we have the glorified body and a glorified mind, and I'll say a glorified attitude, amen? You know, there's so many people today that are called Christians that are so despondent. And so down and out. Folks, we ought to be proof positive evidence that Christ is alive. Amen. That he's coming again. That he saved us past tense, present tense, and future tense. We're going to be delivered from this earth. And some of us is closer than we think. Man, I've, I've, I've never heard of so many people getting sick. And I'm not talking about just COVID. I'm talking about heart attacks and strokes and all kinds of stuff. I guess because my friends are getting as old as I am. And they're dying. Uh, I was talking to Brother Max Alderman. He said, I've lost five preacher friends in the last month. One of them called him Friday on the ventilator, took his ventilator off long enough to say, Brother Max, preach my funeral. He's a, he's a Brother Burge, Burge, the head of uh, Forgotten Missions, uh, for, Forgotten People, a great man of God, started this mission's organization, this mission board, and does a great work worldwide. He's on his last mile. And he said, Brother Max, will you come preach my funeral? And so, folks, it's, it's all around us. And if we're not careful, we're going to get discouraged. If we're not careful, we're going to get discouraged about going, people going to heaven. And that's oxymoron. We should never get discouraged about going to heaven. Amen? It's like John R. Rice one time had a gun pulled to, uh, on him while he was on a on an a elevator, and uh, the, the guy said, uh, aren't you f afraid, old man? He says, you can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> they didn't shoot him. Amen. Matter of fact, they found out he probably had more power of God. He's going, they were going to die if they shot him. But anyway, thank God. Thank God for, the, for the, um, the anticipation, which brings great encouragement that one day, and one day soon, all this is going to be over. And the rapture is going to take place, and we should not be discouraged about that. We should be encouraged that uh, we might be on the last lap. This might be it. You say, oh, no, i got so many plans. That's what's wrong. Your plans are more important than his plans.
We just need to say, God, whatever your plan is. But look at these verse 24 again. It says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for that a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Let's turn to Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. You knew I was going to go there eventually. Titus. I want you to look at it. Uh, I, I want you to see it. All the books of the T's are together and they're alphabetical. So if that helps you. Turn to Hebrews and turn back. But look at Titus. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. I love this verse. It says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We're talking about Labor Day tomorrow. I don't know why we have Labor Day, but it must be a good day, and I don't care what it is, it's a day off. But I'll tell you this, friend, the greatest labor you can ever have is for the Lord. And folks, we need to realize that he gave himself for us. We're not indebted to the flesh, and we ought to be zealous of good works. We ought to be excited that we can do something for God. And I want to thank every one of you for doing your part, from ushering to counting the offering to leading the singing to singing to playing the musician, the, the instruments. Uh, you're important. But I want to tell you something, friend. The one you're doing it for is more important than all of us. And folks, in these last days, we ought to turn it up. We ought to be more accountable in the local church. And we ought to visit more. And we ought to realize time is of the essence. And that, folks, we need to look for the blessed hope. He could come any minute. And if he told you that he was going to come Thursday, Monday through Wednesday would be an active week. Amen. Number one, you wouldn't be discouraged. Number two, you'd be trying to encourage everybody else. And number three, you'd be trying to win everybody the Lord you could if you really had a note from heaven that this Thursday, I'm coming again. Get ready, the rapture's gonna take place. Well, I'm gonna say this. He could come tonight. Amen. He could come this moment in a twinkling of an eye. And folks would need to be excited about that anticipation. The best is yet to come. Keep looking up, but praise God, we Christians ought to keep looking forward. But in the meantime, there'll be a groaning in our soul because we're going to get sick and tired of this sick and tired world. And we need to long for heaven, but it should be a motivation, not just a destination. A lot of people say, oh, if I can just get through it, amen. I can just get through it, you know. I'm going to hold out this last quarter and Hope they don't score. Folks, it's more than a ball game, praise God. Folks, this is the last lap. This is the very time that we need to turn it up. This is the very time that we need to hand out more tracks than we ever have. Because, folks, there's a blessed hope and anticipation. And the world is vanity. It's empty. It's longing. And I believe with all my heart, people are listening better now than they have ever have been. But we're afraid to go to them. And folks, we ought to have freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And so number one, the creation groans and the believer groans, and I'll preach this next week, and I've already touched on it a couple of weeks ago, the Holy Spirit groans. There's three groans. The Holy Spirit groans. Look at verse 26. Um, and I want you to see this. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself inter maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God's concern about the trials of his people. And God's concern about the attitude of his people. And folks, when, the, when we're ministering on this earth, Jesus groaned. Why did Jesus groan? Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 34. Mark chapter 7 and verse 34. The Bible says this, And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to them, Ephetha, that is, be open. He was talking about to a deaf man, 
and a dumb man. Nobody else could speak to him except him because he was deaf and he had an impotent of speech and they beseeched him to put his hand upon him. And look at verse 33. This wouldn't be medically accepted today. And he took him aside, verse 33 of Mark chapter 7, from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Praise God, y'all knock... Y'all would definitely go, not go back to that doctor if he spit and touched your tongue. But this is the almighty God. And folks, I want to tell you something. He sighed at his condition. He cared. Look at John chapter 11, please. John chapter 11, verse 33. Real quick, John chapter, hey, the Holy Spirit will make you like Jesus if you'll let him. And I want to tell you something. Jesus went through a lot, but he never lost hope. And he never lost his trail. And he never lost the, why God called him to this earth. He set his face like a flint. He was going to Calvary no matter what men would say or do to him. And that's the way we ought to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen. Don't get discouraged. Don't let the devil discourage. That's his number one tool. No, that's number two. His number one tool is pride. I can make it without prayer. I can make it without coming to Sunday school. I can make it without reading my Bible. I'm gonna tell you something, folks. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit are not expendable. They're essential for your life. And I'll tell you something, the church that preaches it and teaches it is essential in your life too. And folks, this is an essential organization. Say amen. amen. Counsel the ball games, counsel the theaters, counsel the grocery stores, and let us order by line, online. But please, let's don't counsel the church. Because the church is essential. And we need the church. Just seeing you has encouraged me. Not many of you. And not, some of you don't look like you don't even be here. But you're encouraging me. Because you're listening to the word of God. And you're faithful in season, out of season. But look at uh, John chapter 11. And I'll close. Verse 33. And uh, you know the story. Lazarus has died. And he waits three days. Because God's always on time, but we want to dictate what time he ought to be there. And look at verse 33, it says, And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and Jesus weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, that, that moves me. I don't know about moves you, but folks, God cares. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And get me. let me just say this in closing. The Holy Spirit loves you enough to groan with you and groan for you. Have you ever been in a situation where words were not efficient, sufficient? I mean, when you get some news like some of y'all have got, no, no preacher's phone call can comfort you. No past message that you heard in, the, in your church could comfort you. Only the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit groaning and revealing that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to His purpose. And in context of these verses, the Spirit of God groans with intercession for the saints to know and accept that all things work together. So folks, we're never to say it's out of control because God's in control. And I don't like some of the things that He's allowed and neither do you. But I'll say this. If you're in the Spirit and you're praying in the Spirit, you can accept and go on. I didn't say you'd like it. Losing a son, you don't like it. It's a heartache and a heartbreak that only the people that's been through that understand. To lose a daughter in a head-on collision. To lose a wife. To lose a mother. God is concerned about what we're going through. And to prove it, look at verse 38 of John chapter 11. The Bible says this. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, coming to the grave, there was a cave and a stone laid about. And folks, we see that Jesus said to her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, verse 40, thou shouldest see the glory of God. 
See, the, the end of all this heartache and all this pain and all this weakness and all this suffering, and yes, all the groaning, even creation groans, even the believer groans, and the Holy Spirit groans in us and through us. Prays for us and with us and escorts us into the presence of God. Reveals to us that the Spirit intercedes to help us realize that even suffering is the will of God. And that He's predetermined that one day we be like Him. And folks, I want to tell you something. We've had to drop two missionaries, and I'm going to tell the deacons uh, who they are, and I'm not even going to vote on them. It's turned to Calvinism. And they ain't getting one red cent from this church. If somebody believes you're predestined to go to hell, you're an imposter if you think, you think you're a missionary. You're not a missionary. And folks, it's sad today, this intellectual grace movement. We're going to figure God out, and we're going to say that uh, some people are predestined for ordained for the foundation of the world to go to hell and some are predestined to go to heaven and folks I want to tell you something that's a damnable doctrine Calvinism you ought to stand against it you ought to stand away from it but I do believe in predestination and I believe that it's predetermined in Romans chapter 8 verse 28 that the Holy Spirit can give us comfort even in our groanings because thank God he knows for we know all things work together for the good of them that love God. And so let me just say this, and my time's up, that I've said on myself, and I believe the Holy Spirit's saying amen. <laughs> the bottom line is, do you love God? And if you don't, you're in trouble. Because I'm going to tell you something, there's some things you're going to have to be so in love with God because your heart's going to be angry. And your heart's going to groan. And your heart's going to hurt. And your heart's going to be disappointed. And your heart could question God and get utterly disappointed, discouraged, and depressed and turn from God and quit the church because the baby dies. And we've had several do that. Quit the church because mama died. Quit the church because husband died or son or daughter died. Folks, I want to tell you something. That's even more time you need the church. And it goes on to say, for we know that all things work together for good, and I'm going to preach this next Sunday, so I've got, I got to be brief. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, listen to this, to them who are called according to his purpose. Here's the bottom line. Suffering, if you have suffering, if you have discouragement, it's a perp there's a purpose in it. And what is that purpose? To respond to the Holy Ghost and say, God, you're still in charge. God, you're still on the throne. God, I trust you. I don't like this. I, don't, I can't figure it out, but I'm going to have faith in thee. And only the Holy Spirit can give you that. Because look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, for whom is a continuing thought of we know. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's saying, folks, that you're being predestined, foreordained, before the foundations of the world to be saved. Second Peter 3, 9. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? And folks, we're condemned because we refuse to believe John 3, 18 through 21. And we Christians should, be over, should overcome discouragement and suffering in the light of this glorious truth that all things work together. And we're called to a purpose. In verse 29, that purpose is to be like Jesus. So whatever God's allowed in your life, He wants you to be more like Jesus. And folks, you're going to get discouraged to the kilt if you just think it's all about now and it's all about this life. You're going to join creation and groan. 
You're gonna, you're gonna, you need to join the Holy Ghost and realize he's groaning, but he's also interceding. And he's saying, this is the will of God. And this is the way I want you to act. And this is the way I want you to react. I want you to have faith in God. And here it is, last sentence. And hope in him. Father, use this message. God, I needed it. If nobody else showed up tonight, if nobody tuned in tonight, I need this word of encouragement. God, thank you for the three groans of this chapter. Creation groans. Believers groan. But I thank God you groan. And you care. And you're heartbroken about sin heartbroken about the condition of the church today and all these people that are recanting and quitting and not being faithful and find every excuse in the world not to be faithful and going to the contemporary movement and going to the entertainment movement and going to the flesh movement and not moving closer to the Holy Ghost preached word of God Lord Holy Spirit thank you for caring enough to groan and God, may we never mistaken that the reason you're groan, groaning is because you care and you love us. And Lord, probably we put groans in your heart when we don't anticipate that you're going to use everything together to make us more like you. God, increase our faith because this is not filling stuff. This is not reacting by what we feel is natural. God, this is supernatural. And we need your grace. We need your spirit. We need to stay in Romans chapter 8 and never fall back to Romans chapter 7 and doubt you and depend upon ourselves.